Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Hi, um, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I uh, am with OCTO, the Open Communications for the Ocean. And at OCTO, I coordinate the Coastal Marine Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network and edit the newsletter, the, marine, um, the Skimmer on Marine Ecosystems and Management. Um, we're very pleased that you could be with us today. Um, and we welcome today April Crow from Circulate Capital, who's gonna be speaking about Circulate Capital's Ocean Fund. Uh, before we get started, I want to let everyone know that uh, April's going to be presenting first, and then we'll have uh, ample time for question and answer afterwards. Uh, there are two ways to ask questions. You can either send them in through the, the question panel, um, in which case they'll only be vis visible to the, uh, the moderators, um, or you can send them into the chat, and you have options with the chat of making them visible to other participants um, or just to the um, the panelists and, and moderators. Now, um, we allow chatting between participants. If you wish to use this option, we just ask that you keep it professional and on topic. Okay, Jenna, or April, thank you so much for being here. Um, I will turn it over to you now. Great, uh, thank you so much, Sarah. And um, just hello to everyone, wherever you're sitting um, in your part of the world. And I'm assuming we have a lot in the US, so I hope that many of you are enjoying some beautiful sunshine today. And I hope um, in the not too long um, future, we will all be able to be together in conferences and other opportunities to engage. But um, just wanna thank you for taking a little time this afternoon to talk about um, Circulate Capital and preventing ocean plastics. Um, I've been working in this space for a long time. Um, more of probably 15 years ago, uh, working a lot on recycling and packaging. And um, there's very little known about the plastics in the ocean issue at that point. There was information around the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, you know, lots of misinformation um, around that. And it wasn't until more recent years that um, many within this community, many scientists and um, academics really help to start to get more specific about the sources of this issue and some of the um, information that we needed to really start to prioritize our efforts within this space. So I wanna spend just a little time, I know many of you probably um, can recite these um, facts very well, but um, just the issue itself. Um, scientists estimate that more than 150 million tons of plastic are in the ocean um, right now, with um, continued growth of 8 million tons um, being added each year. And um, it is expected that if we do not take action, this number will, will triple. What we know from some of the scientific studies, uh, one of those uh, led by Jenna Jambach in 2015, is that a significant portion of this plastic is coming from South and Southeast Asia. I would say when that study came out um, through the National Center for Eco Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, the NC's working group that Jenna was a part of along with um, many other scientists was a really large turning point in better understanding this issue. Following that study that was published in Science, uh, Ocean Conservancy did some additional work that looked at understanding what it would take to really start to stop the flow, focusing on those countries. And what they concluded is uh, an estimate that we could reduce this by 45% by really focusing on improving waste management and recycling in these key countries within South and Southeast Asia. Uh, it's one of those where economic development has really outpaced uh, the solid waste system being established in these countries. But what we know is this is a very uh, expensive um, activity. So some of the numbers that have been thrown around are around $5 billion needed um, each year just to start to tackle this uh, issue. And 
in addition to just those billions I just mentioned, there are a lot of additional costs that we're seeing with this issue. It, looking at this slide here, you can see um, the damage to marine ecosystems of almost $13 billion. Uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and their circular economy work often talks about the, the lost value of packaging estimated to be between 80 to 120 billion of material that's lost after its first use. So you know, how do we recognize that value? And then additional costs uh, around the loss to tourism, fishing, and shipping industries at over $10 billion. And then there's also additional financial risk that if um, businesses could face, if governments started to require them to cover the costs of um, the current waste management needs and um, with consideration of the increased volumes and the challenges to recyclability that exist today. So th these are just some of the numbers that we were already using. Now you couple that with um, the COVID-19 crisis and um, it indeed has had an even greater impact on this and um, the, the local waste management and recycling value chains are stretched even more. Um, we know that these basic systems are important to community health and livelihood as well as the environment. And, um, the UN Environment Program has urged governments to treat waste management as urgent and an essential public service to minimize both environmental and health risk. Some of you may have seen um, just within the past two weeks, we, we released a white paper where we really started to look at um, what the um, what COVID-19 um, has meant to those who are working in this value chain already. And um, it, we know that the use of single-use plastic has increased. Um, it, in Thailand alone, uh, some of the information that we got from the Pollution Control Department showed that plastic waste has risen by 15% due to a threefold increase in food uh, delivery services. And then within that, the plastic waste recycling value chain has been really disrupted where not all private recyclers were classified as essential. So um, in some of the work that was done, um, we found that 40 to 60% of those that are working in this value chain today are really at risk um, of, of closing down or going bankrupt. And uh, it's really um, important that we look at ways to help resolve this issue because the challenge was great and it's becoming even greater now. So we really have to look at this. So to get a little bit more into what Circulate Capital is uh, working on, um, I often talk about within this what the million dollar question, um, or in this case, the multi-billion dollar question is where will all those billions of dollars come from? We um, have this really big challenge and a really big gap in the amount of funding that's needed. But what we know is that those billions of dollars will have to come from the institutional investors and those who are currently financing infrastructure in South and Southeast Asia. Right now, they're not um, really set up to fund these types of solutions that we're looking at in the waste and recycling space, um, the lack of visible pipeline, um, not having really a track record around this type of um, investable space and um, having the right investment products. We really have to um, figure out how to fill in this, what we call the missing middle, um, that currently it fails to connect the capital to the operators who are looking for this money. And so what our focus is on is around attracting those institutional investors. And to do so, it's really proving that this sector is scalable within this region, um, the region being South and Southeast Asia, and that it can actually generate competitive returns uh, in order to attract them uh, to start deploying um, funding within this part of the world and in, in this um, topic area. So we know that um, as we look at uh, how the solution uh, could come uh, to bear on the challenge that we have, 
we really have to look at it in two ways, um, both with a philanthropic, philanthropic piece, as well as this catalytic capital role um, that I mentioned before. So if you look at our diagram um, that I have on the screen now, it's really about starting with some of the philanthropic um, funding that has been available and continues to be available to look at how we innovate and test business models that can um, be set up in a way and build an ecosystem to support them where they can be successful and at the same time start to make those investments and build a track record and um, proof around these business models where we can test and scale and start to build this on-ramp um, of in investable opportunities that then we can hand off to institutional investors. This has happened in other in the medical field and then with other challenges, but this is um, our fund is really focused on how we can demonstrate this in the waste and recycling um, space and in circular economy more general. So if you're not familiar with Circulate Capital Ocean Fund, um, it, it started as an initiative, a project, uh, really looking at, um, through some of the company names that you see on the screen now, uh, really asking, is there an opportunity to look at a sustainable financing model within uh, the waste and recycling space in this part of the world? You know, many of them have um, put in more CSR or philanthropic dollars in the past, but there's a recognition, um, as you can see, even between competitors, that in order to get at solving this challenge, we have to work in a very collaborative way. So um, we have some of the leading companies from PepsiCo, Danone, Chanel, Unilever, Dow, Chevron Phillips, Coca-Cola, and P&G who all committed funding. We raised a little over $106 million dedicated to this fund, again, focused on South and Southeast Asia, and also received support from the US International Development Finance Corporation um, in helping guarantee some of the loans that we're providing, uh, which helps us further de-risk these deals. So with this initial fund, we are starting to invest in startups and small and medium enterprises across the plastic value chain um, initially, looking at innovative materials, um, recycling infrastructure, all focused on how we can stop the plastic from flowing into the ocean through great infrastructure or new innovative technologies and approaches and then demonstrating that this is a, a space within the, um, with circular economy principles that you can actually generate attractive financial returns. So as I mentioned, um, you know, a number of the companies that, probably all of the companies that are uh, a part of the fund have been involved in providing um, grants or philanthropic support in the past. But what I'm showing here on the screen are the structural tenants that we've set up for, um, for our fund. Um, it is really focused on the fact that they are truly investments. So they, uh, there's an expectation from those who have provided funding and, and our um, thesis of how we will operate. Um, this, is, this is really about being able to generate a level of return and um, measurable impact to demonstrate this model and to um, really start to facilitate the change that we need to see. Um, as we look at investment opportunities, we are focused on those that are um, scalable and something that we can replicate both within the region and then with a lens of things that may work in other parts of the world but um, really looking at um, how they can be measured, evaluated, and how we share this information. Because while you know, we have $100 million, the challenge is great. So we wanna make sure that um, we are coming up with the type of investable opportunities and demonstrate how they can happen um, in, in other areas. This uh, is really focused on uh, the fact that we really need to have um, companies, industries, the whole value chain coming together for systemic change. 
uh, again, recognizing that no one company or organization can, can do this independently. So by starting to bring together um, the, not only the funds, but also um, each of our investors are providing their technical knowledge, their global supply chain knowledge to help each of these investments be successful. So um, it's what makes us a little unique from some other investment funds um, it, that may be working in um, similar spaces. And then ultimately, as I talk about that catalytic capital concept, we have a goal of unlocking that additional co-investment um, to be able to bring in other investors and bring in the additional capital that allows us to attract um, and bring in additional funding to support this area. So as we look at our investment thesis um, and really how we see within this space some of the opportunities to um, invest and um, make a difference within the plastics and the ocean issue, you'll see three different areas here. Um, innovation, diversion, and markets. Um, and I wanna call this out, it says lower priority and higher priority. This is not reflective of what may have an impact on the issue itself because there could be some great moonshots in that innovation space that really help solve this challenge a lot more than diversion um, and keeping things out of the, um, into uh, basic collection and um, uh, sorting and collection infrastructure. Um, this, when you see the lower and higher priority is really based on how we're looking at this from an investment opportunity space. Um, when we did our initial landscape study in the countries before we created Circulate Capital, as I mentioned, it was a project and initiative. Um, we, we went into all of the um, countries that we're focused on now. So India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, and Thailand, and looked at what was happening already and where we believe the biggest opportunities were to make investments, to show a return, and then get the impact that we wanna see in these spaces. So then the innovation space, it's fairly straightforward that this is really about developing um, new materials, um, looking at next generation um, packaging delivery systems, how we can reuse materials, how we can reuse packaging, eliminate packaging altogether. So that's um, what falls within that pathway of innovation. And then where our first investments are, are being made, um, and I'll talk about a couple of specific ones in a minute, are in this uh, diversion and market category. So within diversion, it is around looking at how we build collection systems and sorting systems improving the productivity of how this works today um, to prevent the flow of plastics into the ocean and making sure that waste is properly collected and sorted. And then this last um, area around markets is looking at how we can drive demand for that recycled material. Most of the companies that um, are uh, our funders, they have significant commitments, um, many other consumer goods companies around the world have significant targets that they're trying to reach on including recycled content. So we're working on how to make it where it may be that it, we need to advance the ability to do food grade technology um, or just other areas to help improve the markets um, for these materials and ensure that we can to meet, meet the demand and um, help improve the technology and the infrastructure needed within this space. So I mentioned um, that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about a couple of our um, first investments. Um, so you'll see the, the two companies, Lucro um, is the first based in, um, in India. It is a manufacturer, that, um, they're based in Mumbai and they were, uh, focus on difficult to uh, recycle um, and manage flexible packaging. So if, if you work in the, um, in the plastic space, you're probably familiar with this is really a challenging space. It's something that um, often doesn't have very much value. And um, they, Lucro is focused on um, this as a specialty area. 
and uh, working at how they can sell the material that they're um, producing um, to other facilities across India. Um, as we look at uh, these different companies, you know, there are different things that stand out on why we decide to invest in certain companies over, the, uh, over others. Uh, this one with Lucro, the, the team that they have, very entrepreneurial mindset. They have um, a business model that is working and a real desire to expand. Um, so they have a strong expansion plan. You know, they had been working to get traditional um, funding, but in many cases, whether it was Lucro or others, you know, banks have not seen this. Um, again, they don't have that um, history around um, you know, making loans or um, seeing the investability of these spaces. And so that's what we're trying to do is to, to identify those companies that we believe have a lot of potential so we can get that return and, um, and open it up to others to be able to support that. Um, so we think that Lucro is really well positioned um, to, to be a, a leader in this space. And then the second company is called uh, Treaty Oasis and they are based in Indonesia. It's a, as you can see on the slide, it's a female-led company uh, that specializes in recycling PET bottles and turning them into our pet flakes, um, both for packaging and for textiles. They are um, a fairly young company, um, but it was co-founded by two female entrepreneurs, um, very smart women who uh, are, really leading the way in this space and have a strong desire to um, improve the quality of the material, um, to give them the ability to open up to other markets um, and that could also allow for you know, them to separate themselves out and increase their um, the financials around this and also really trying to lead the way in transparency and traceability with um, their work. So they have um, ramped up their business and um, really looking to create um, the, and, and fulfill the demand for this material within that market. So if, I'll see if technology will work, we may actually have a, um, a video, and I hope it will work, so you can hear a little bit from these founders themselves about their work. Indonesia is considered as the second biggest marine polluter in the world. I believe plastic waste is a raw material, but it's just in the wrong place. So 3D Oasis is a home ground Indonesian recycling company. We recycle PET bottle waste into recycled PET flakes. We know that unemployment rate is high in Indonesia, and I hope this business is getting bigger and can scale up across Indonesia. We pitch that this business is profitable. And now we are in the middle of growing out our capacity and also diversifying our recycled plastic products. So being connected with circular capital that can offer not only the funding, but as well as market access and also the technology in the recycling, is helpful to bring 3D to the next level and achieve a full circular. Great. Well, I hope I can't um, get reactions from folks, but I, I hope that you're able to hear that and um, can appreciate. Uh, the enthusiasm that we have for this company and um, the leadership that they have within it. We have a lot of um, optimism around what they will be able to do and again the returns that we should be able to, to have um, with Treaty Oasis. So as we think about our results and what we are targeting um, and how we actually measure the success of what we will do um, at Circulate Capital, the Ocean Fund, and um, the, the impacts that we'll have, it's really you know, broader than just the financial return. So I have a list here that clearly generating a financial return is, um, is key. There are expectations that our investors have and to be able to 
bring in the additional catalytic capital, the second bullet point, we'll have to be able to show those financial returns. So that's one of the lens um, that we use as we look at investable opportunities. And um, then the third bullet point here is around preventing plastic pollution. So as we identify and assess, um, and our, our investment team um, has assessed hundreds of opportunities um, since, we, since we started and looking at which ones really have the most potential to prevent plastic pollution and being able to measure that, as well as looking at it from societal benefits um, and uh, looking at um, both not only the environmental space, but um, the, the social um, and economic um, benefits within communities as we increase our investments. And then how they contribute to the sector overall and advance the circular economy. Um, so this is a, a new space, as I'm sure most of you know, that um, we're, we're working to uh, develop our metrics around these and working with others um, that may be doing similar work to really to be able to um, measure the impacts. And as I really start to conclude my comments here, I think that um, I would be remiss to not point out that um, you know, this is one piece of the solution. There was a, a study that just came out from Systemic and, and Pew Charitable Trust that talks about um, the ability to uh, reduce our plastic leakage by 2040, which is a long way away, um, if we implement systemic solutions, but that has to come in the form of public policy and having these um, public-private collaborations, changing behaviors overall, and then looking at financial incentive, incentives. Um, so basically no silver bullet for this, but really looking at how we can collectively tackle this issue. Um, I personally remain optimistic on this. As I mentioned, I started working on this 15 years ago when there were just a handful of people trying to understand the issue and the fact that um, so many people are engaged and the general public is now aware of this. I, I believe that um, we will start to make a dent um, in this issue in, in the coming years. So with that, I will um, conclude. I have, um, if anybody wants to follow up after, uh, well, I know we'll answer a few questions now, um, but uh, we have information on our website, um, circulatecapital.com, some of our reports. Uh, the white paper I mentioned on the COVID-19 study and impacts is there. When we, um, right after we first launched, we released a investor handbook that has a lot of the learning um, that we had from our on the ground work and um, within the region initially that um, is a good handbook for those who are interested in investing overall and just a number of other resources. So please take a look there. Um, and then uh, if you want to email me or I can get you in touch with others on our team if you're interested in learning more. Okay. Thank you so much, April. Uh, that was a great overview. And um, we have a, a number of questions already, and I just want to remind everyone, if you want to send in questions, you can send them either into the, the chat panel or the Q&A. Um, so one question that came in, April, is it says, um, there are numerous vested interests among the corporate investors behind this fund. How does Circulate Capital plan to stay neutral in addressing the value chain holistically, including upstream reduction business models, and then not only limit itself to and not only limit itself to downstream recycling solutions? That's a great question. Uh, just, you know, I think it's important to note kind of our, our process for these. As I mentioned, these first two investments have been more at uh, looking at the downstream side because that's where the investable opportunities are. Um, but many of our funders, um, along with the work that we are doing, are focused on um, reduction efforts, um, looking at alternative materials, um, new ways to deliver products to consumers. And that was, um, if you I don't know, if you remember the slide that I had that really showed kind of the three different pathways, um, that first one really focused on innovation. So that's another area that we're looking at um, 
And then while the funders are involved, we have an independent investment committee that reviews and makes the ultimate decision on um, our, we have an investment team that is based in Singapore, India, and Indonesia, investment professionals who are out there assessing and making recommendations um, with this. So we also have some independence uh, there as well. Okay, thank you, April. Um, another question, how do you discover the companies that you're going to invest in? Does Circulate Capital provide other support to these companies besides financial investment? Um, for example, training and leadership, management, finances? They come from a number of different um, sources. So um, calls like this. So if, if you all know of a company, um, you're always looking. We have an RFP on our website. Um, but largely, I would say it is from these investment professionals who I mentioned who are working there on the ground. They have um, relationships and networks within India, Indonesia. We're starting our work in the Philippines and Thailand um, that are out researching and working to identify where we think um, the, the most investable opportunities are. And we go through an assessment um, phase with that. But it is a lot of public sourcing, um, you know, looking at how we raise our profile within these countries. I'm actually the only person that's based here in the US. I guess I should have said that in the beginning. The fund is actually based in Singapore. Some of you may know Rob Kaplan, who is our CEO. He's based in um, Singapore. He was originally a co-founder of the Closed Loop Fund here in the US, but moved his family from New York to Singapore. And the rest of our team is there in India, Indonesia, um, and uh, Vietnam currently. Um, so they are there on the ground. And then the second part of this question, um, we do provide um, the beyond the financial piece, um, we are actively engaged with these um, investments. So in terms of providing technical and business knowledge that they can leverage from our funders, so the, the major companies that we talked about, um, we have a way for them to mentor or provide um, technical assistance um, and connections through that. And then we also launched during COVID um, a, a specific leadership program, both for the companies that we have currently invested in and within our pipeline. Um, focused on how to manage through challenging times because you know we see a time where it is very difficult for many of these companies um, and, and, and a time that none of us have um, been through before. So through a leadership training um, exercise had about six months um, of, and it's ongoing now, of um, mentoring and building a community um, within uh, our investees and um, this, these pipeline companies, because part of it is about building that ecosystem. So uh, working with them to identify where the gaps are and how we can help support. Okay, thank you, April. Um, let's see, what about plastic substitutes or the promotion of the use of biodegradable materials instead? Is it something you're looking at, analyzing and investing in? We have, um, there are, uh, in terms of um, alternative um, materials, uh, as well as um, biomaterials, we've had a few. We have not made any investments um, yet. There are a few within our pipeline that we're looking at um, and really trying to look at um, how we support existing materials, but also look at alternatives um, as well. Okay. All right. Thank you, April. Um, the question, um, are, th are these same companies also investing actively in reducing their plastic output beginning at the factory production level? Yeah, you know, each of the companies have their own sustainability related goals. And a number of them, as I mentioned, are focused on using recycled material, many of them also have um, goals around reduction, um, reducing their um, plastics material and other material usage overall. And then several of them are involved in projects to look at um, more 
um, closed loop and these next generation delivery systems um, as, as a part of this. Um, so separate from our work, um, although we are looking at those as um, investable opportunities as well. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, lots of good questions, everyone. So, okay. You referenced potential moonshots in the innovation space that Circulate Capital could fund. Can you give an example or two of potential moonshots? In other words, what would represent a revolutionary advance in your view? A company called Loop is working with name brand consumer product manufacturers in the U.S. to put merchandise in standardized containers that can be returned and refilled. Is this a type of program that Circulate Capital would like to see spread in Asia? Or are... Um, or would it not work in, in South and Southeast Asia? Yeah, it's interesting. There are a number of similar models. I haven't seen it to the degree. I'm fairly familiar with the loop model. That's what I was referencing that I know a number of the companies are involved in looking at what those next generation delivery systems um, look like. But there are a number of platforms um, in Indonesia that are um, setting up reusable systems um, for, um, for food service takeout, a number of different areas. Um, and so, yes, I mean, that could be, you know, I think when I use the term moonshot, whether it's through us or we also have um, the Circulate Initiative, which is a, a nonprofit, um, almost like a sister organization that is funded to really look at those that are more in a startup mood. Um, most of our investments are three to five plus million dollars, so not as much um, in the very early stage. Um, but, um, you know, another area could be uh, next generation recycling technologies or um, looking at um, how we manage things in a much more um, uh, just an alternative way at the end of life, ways to simplify materials um, overall. Okay, thank you, April. Um, there was a comment that came in and said, this is great, but does it continue to serve the petrochemical industry uh, by shifting costs of dealing with the hugely expanding um, uh, waste from their products to consumers and governments? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the way that we're looking at this is really around um, creating something that is economically viable. Um, it is around creating uh, value out of what exists today and looking for ways to uh, deploy capital in a way that catalyzes additional investment. And so, um, again, our initial focus is more downstream, but looking at alternatives as well. We're, we're um, you know, glad to have a lot, a lot, or I guess a wide range of the value chain participating. Um, within this because it gives um, not only the financial resources, but also the technical resources to think through um, what uh, types of solutions we can bring to bear on this. Okay, thank you. Um, there are several questions about um, Africa. One, is there an opportunity for Circulate Capital to look at Africa as an investment destination? And then questions about whether Circulate Capital is working in Nigeria and Ghana or um, supporting Africa, especially West Africa. Yeah, we aren't today. This, when um, our fund started, it is dedicated, again, kind of built on that original study that I mentioned of Jenna Jambex and um, the work of Ocean Conservancy. So it is dedicated to that part of the world. And right now we are solely focused on it so we can find those investments that can show return and really prove this catalytic capital concept. Um, in the future, whether it's us or someone else, um, you know, there, I think there, whether it's there or um, Latin America, there are a number of different areas where this could potentially um, be a, a, a great option to bring in additional investments. Um, we remain, um, again, focused on this part of the world for now uh, and hope that we will have some strong results that we can share uh, across the globe. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to read you two questions um, right now. First, um, do you view stormwater trash interception, that is removal from the streams and rivers, as an urgently needed triage while the upstream and downstream solutions are being developed? There was another uh, question. Um, 
Ah. Okay, the more plastic items are reused and recycled, the less will end up in the ocean. Still, mismanaged plastic litter will be transported via rivers to the ocean. Is structural plastic removal from rivers combined with recycling these items within the scope of the fund? Yeah, having spent quite a bit of time on the ground in these countries, I think it is definitely something that has to be a focus of an overall solution set. So um, I vividly remember being in Jakarta several years ago and seeing the waste management system or what that was called. It was a transfer station that was right next to a river and so much flowing in um, through that. So what while we are focused more on um, the infrastructure uh, that helps formalize this and puts it into place. I think there are opportunities to, whether it's you know through circulating capital or some of those that we are associated with, um, helping think about what those other um, first lines of defense are. That um, really identifying that that those needs within rivers and stopping the flow um, is also a great um, step in st stopping the flow into the oceans overall. Okay, thank you, April. Um, a comment and question, love the female owned treaty.org. Are the plastic chips kept in the value chain at the same value and can they be chipped again? The, um, at the same value, they are, um, right now it's a challenging time as if, if many of you work in um, the, with recycled materials overall that, um, the, with the price of oil being so low, virgin material is um, is cheaper currently than um, recycled material. So what, you know, with each of these investments, we're working with them to make their processes as efficient as possible. And then also working with these, um, you know, the companies that are investors um, to circulate capital and others who have these commitments um, that they remain committed to those um, in order to uh, be able to um, invest their um, dollars in helping ensure that these um, financials remain successful for uh, the fleet that's coming out of this and other uh, investments in that space. Um, and yes, they, they can be reused again. Um, I mean, there are some li limitations um, from a PET perspective, it um, is not as recyclable as say an aluminum can, but you can continue to bring it back and with the right technologies and right processes, it is something that can be recycled once more than once. Okay, thank you. There were a couple of questions about, um, uh, okay, so is there any risk with using recycled plastic for food packaging, for example? Is that something you're dealing with with your investments? Yeah, only certain, um, certain polymers and then in certain countries um, are their uh, approval. So as an example, PET, you can have food grade quality PET. And so that's part of what I mentioned Treaty Oasis is working on is to ensure that there are basically quality standards. So you know, FDA type approvals for being able to use and sell food grade materials that would make um, certain that there are no risks for that. So they, they have, they're all held to certain standards that um, throughout Europe, throughout US, you know, that's a common um, standard and a, a common process and so we continue to work with these companies for those where it is um, technically and legally allowed um, to do so now. Okay, thank you. Um, has your group looked at businesses uh, using uh, technologies that can per convert plastic to oil? If so, does this technology look promising to circulate capital? You know, with that, um, the investment team is looking at a number of different technologies right now. I personally can't comment on um, any that they've seen um, to date that would be promising. If somebody has uh, one that they would like to share or dig in too deeper, please reach out and I'm happy to um, dig into it a little bit further. Okay, and I would just say there was also a question about plastic pyrolysis, um, if, if you're able to speak to that anymore. Um, great. If not, I guess the same answer will remain to get in touch for more information. Okay. 
Um, let's see. And there's a question, the, the founding companies are mostly those that have been identified as top plastic polluters. Many have net annual revenues in excess of 30 billion a year. Do you have a long-term commitment from them to keep uh, infusing money into your investment selections? It seems like they easily could and should contribute animal, annually to the money gap you mentioned. Yeah, so as a part of our fund, um, these are long-term commitments. So the hundred, a little over a hundred million dollars that I, I mentioned um, is over the next five years. So we do have a, a long-term commitment with them, and you know, and we're one element of their overall plans of how they are working in this space. Um, but they're involved not only financially, but um, as I mentioned, with their technical and business support as well. Okay, thank you, April. Um, a question is, um, rather than focusing attention on collecting plastic from river systems, is anyone at Circulate studying the feasibility of incentivizing consumers and pickers to return or collect their single-use packages uh, to a centralized facility before it enters the waterways? There are some, um, as we've looked at investable opportunities, again, we're not as involved on um, all types of solutions, but some of the ones um, that we looked at are really more on the collection side. So um, there are a few companies that we've seen that um, have different uh, in incentivization models, um, you know, different types of um, collection systems that are working in some communities and they're looking at how they expand. So that's definitely within the kind of the scope of opportunities that we're looking at. Okay, all right. Thank you, April. Um, another quest, comment question. Um, I am new to investment capital, though my understanding is that these capital sources are often tied to extractive economies that are tied to human rights, indigenous sovereignty, and disproportionate environmental injustices. How are you committing to just transition when thinking about circular eco? Yes, yeah, so a part of our, um, as we go through um, assessing and beginning due diligence um, before we make an investment, uh, we are looking at all elements, um, as I mentioned, kind of the social, environmental, the human elements um, as well, um, and, and using that lens um, for investments um, within the space. And, and it is a challenging one. Um, and so, you know, our work is looking at how we can, again, help advance some of those who are working in this space or companies that actually help support those who their livelihoods maybe depend on their ability to collect these materials and helping further um, downstream um, with ensuring that um, there's funding to help bring them into uh, more um, sustainable jobs. Okay, thank you. Um, a question, um, this is from Gamal from eWaste, which uh, in parentheses, Uber for Trash, waste man it's a waste management startup in Indonesia. And it said, what kind of metrics are you looking for in a startup? That's great. Um, Gamal, if we're not in touch, you should definitely reach out and, and we can follow up more specifically. Um, you know, it's similar to what I, I mentioned before, you know, it's understanding uh, what the financial model and what the business model looks like to date, um, what the potential is, um, and also on the more on the environmental metrics as well, and looking at um, what impact um, a company uh, like your Uber for Trash could have, um, its ability to scale and replicate um, in the future are some of the things that um, would be considered. Okay, thank you. Um, a question, how will you be measuring fund impact and success over the long term? Yeah, it really is a, a combination of, again, those financial impacts along with um, the diversion of um, plastic pollution, uh, the catalytic capital that I mentioned. Basically, for every dollar that we're putting in, we hope that that returns at least three more. So being able to, and, and we do, we track each of these things. And as we were reporting back to, um, you know, our investors on uh, how we are performing, those elements are a piece of that. And um, it, 
again, trying to build out in partnership with others, what some of the broader metrics look like um, as we're all starting to work in this space. Okay. Okay. Thank you, April. Um, a question. So, uh, okay. After the plastics have been chipped and have been recycled one more time in the value chain, then what? What are these funders doing about the end of life responsibility for their products? Um, and and point, the, the questioner pointed out that Coca-Cola has been labeled the highest plastic polluter in the world. So it can be, you know, plastic can be recycled once, but not infinitely. So then what? Yeah, so I, I can't really speak for Coca-Cola. I can speak for, you know, the work that um, they're contributing um, for us. And it is, again, on meeting their commitments and um, upholding their commitments around using recycled material and making things, uh, ensuring that all of their materials are recyclable, and then looking at ways that they can reduce their usage overall. Um, so we have them you know, committed as a part of our fund, and then they have a number of other initiatives um, as well. Okay, okay. There's a, another question. Is there any thought to asking governments to add a cleanup tax to products packaged in single-use plastics? Is Circulate Capital going to be work on, on this front any? Yeah, you know, we are not just because, again, we are focused on the investment side, um, are not necessarily involved in the policy and suggestions for, for governments right now. Um, and, and I don't see us being the, just because of our focus on the investment side. But as I mentioned in the end, this is a space where forums like this um, and the people who are working um, alongside and in partnership with all of us have to look for what those other levers are because this is one component. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. We, we have a couple more questions. Um, landfills are an important source of plastics in the environment, at least in Indonesia. Do you have a specific strategy to invest in the infrastructure? Simple walls could help to prevent plastic waste to spread out from the landfills? From uh, an investment standpoint, um, I think we'd have to look at it to see, clearly there could be potential around that metric of preventing plastic into the ocean. Um, we'd also need to see how that marries up to a financial re return. So that may just be basic infrastructure that needs to be in place. So encouraging local municipalities or governments to do so. But if there's an investment opportunity, it, it could be um, worth exploring. I, I can't, I don't know if it's been something that we've looked at just because of the number. Um, but again, please send any suggestions if you have, um, have seen uh, potential uh, companies or an investable opportunity, please send them along. Okay, thank you. Um, a question about micro, microfibers. So uh, one of the companies circulate capital invested in is processing pet into our pet flakes for reuse in things like textiles. Yet uh, textiles made with pet, especially recycled pet, shed microfibers easily when the material is rubbed, shaken, and especially when laundered. Microfibers are now found in the air, soil, water, our food and beverages, and our bodies. Was this taken into account when the investment was made? Yeah, I think um, with the I don't know, on the PET versus RPET, I, I hear the concern there on um, just in terms of it getting into the environment. Um, you know, our goal right now is to keep the, the materials and the, um, the uh, circularity going within these spaces. Um, I'd be happy to follow up separately, Catherine, to talk more about um, any types of information that we should be including. Um, that maybe haven't been to date um, within that space. Happy to learn more. Okay, thank you. Um, a question, with the funds focus on generating financial returns for investors, does that bias the fund at all against solutions that involve no packaging? That, that, re read that one more, t one more time. So with the fund's focus on generating financial returns for investors, does that bias the fund at all against solutions that involve no packaging at all? Um, it shouldn't. I mean, if we can find solutions that um, 
eliminate packaging and, and show financial returns, then um, this is really focused on each individual investment that we make and the ROI that we see from that. It's not tied to those who have funded. I think that may be part of the question. Um, but no, I mean, we are certainly looking for any type of innovative solutions um, that could get at solving this problem and demonstrate to other uh, potential investors that um, you can get a return when you invest in circular economy um, type um, approaches. Okay. And let's see, there was a question whether Circular Capital is interested in, in is if they will be investing in Taiwan anytime soon. You know, um, right now it was not a part of the original landscape assessment work, and not to say that there wouldn't be potential um, opportunities in the future. It's just we have a um, limit, limited number of financial resources um, and human resources right now that are on the ground. Um, so we're focused on those uh, initial countries with India and Indonesia being the priority countries um, first, followed by the Philippines, um, Thailand, um, and the Philippines for now. Okay. Well, April, uh, thank you so much. This was a long question and answer, uh, and we appreciate you staying to answer everyone's questions. Um, so thank you very much, and, and thank you to everyone who attended today. We hope you can attend webinars in the future, and um, April's left her contact information uh, for any additional follow-up. So thank you again. We appreciate you coming on to speak to us today. Enjoyed it, and it was, it was great. I, I would love to follow up with many people that um, participated, so please reach out. Okay, thank you. And, and there's lots of thanks coming in through the, uh, the chat and, and the questions too. Okay, thanks everyone, and have a good rest of your day.